I want to begin by thanking all the wonderful team of poets and players uh, for inviting me, for everything you've done to make me feel um, utterly welcome, um, and all of you for coming out today. I'm really honored. I want to begin with a poem, a poem by another poet, uh, Linda Lammas. Um, she was my dear friend and then later my student on the MA at Baspa University. And it was in February of that academic year that she was diagnosed with cancer. I went to visit her uh, in hospital and she reached out to me and said, I want the book. And having remembered that feeling so dearly myself of you know, having published my first book at the age of 40 and how long it felt like I ached for this spine, um, I wanted to do what I could to give it to her. So I edited this collection from volumes of her poems um, her widower gave to me. And Milvran Press, fortunately, uh, brought it up last year. So I, to try to summarize, I can, two things you need to know is that she loved kind of travel, and um, there's both imaginative and real. And so there's a real way in which this book embraces the sense of the world's otherness. And then the value I think it holds most high is compassion for others, for animals, for oneself. So I'll just read one poem, and hopefully that'll be enough of a teaser to uh, temptation to get a few of <coughs> my book. It's wonderful. <coughs> in three sections. The Consul's Dog. One. The Consul sports hibiscus in his buttonhole. Sometimes he walks Shiraz, his dog, by the sea in moonlight. People say Tangier has spiked his senses. <coughs> when he's alone, he wears a spellbound look and a suit tight as a widow's wedding ring. Business is over at the palace. Two tones click across marble floors, and he's off through Bab el Asa, lookout gate, slips into the Medina, the perfume shop where Medina waits upstairs. <laughs> the scent of the attic, her hair teasing his skin, while metal workers in the souk hammer pots and shape and turn until the room spits sweat. She sings as they watch flies pattern the ceiling, the peeling shutters. Even as he kisses her hair, he thinks of leaving. The consul swings through alleys, courtyards, nods and smiles, easy in his element. He strides past blue-tiled cafes where men in jalabas hustle him to play backgammon, smoke-veiled faces lined with hunger. Three. The consul's wife smiles, flatters dinner guests. They are barely aware he is late again. When he strolls in, Shiraz detects the faintest scent of perfume about his clothes, beneath the smoke, the spicy odor of the streets. Late at night, after whiskey or a glass of mint tea, the consul walks his dog to the sea. She waits while he swims to the rocks. And she, too, forgives him. more deliciousness within. Um, the imagined sons of my book's title are all imagined meetings with the son I gave up for adoption when he comes of age. And the very first one, I didn't realize this, I wrote it um, you know, ages ago and it had many titles. And it was only when I was putting this book together that I came up with the title Fairy Tale because I realized that's what I imagined for my first meeting with my son. It helps to know that Aquanet is cheap hairspray. When I was in high school, it's what the boys with mohawks used. Very effective, supposedly. <coughs> Imagine sons one, fairy tale. My son, 
leans from the tower, his red pompadour, stiff with aquanet, resists the quick wind. When he sings, the notes hasten to the forest a mile south before they descend. I clamber onto my restless horse. She starts before I am secure. Almost too soon, we reach the wood. The notes are red. I pluck them like poppies. These are all prose poems, I should say. So if you're listening for line breaks, stop now. Imagine Sons 2, delivery. Pushing a trolley stacked with grocery crates, a delivery man follows me on the circuitous route to my flat. I'm surprised you found it so easily, I say. Your first time. I've been here before, he replies. So you know Bradford on Avon, I say, walking slowly up the slope? No, he says, out of breath, as though the incline's steeper, as though he's Sisyphus. I know you. Um, I came to this country initially to finish a PhD in Victorian fiction. Um, so the reference to our mutual friend in this poem becomes a little bit clearer. And the extent of kind of mythology from the book is um, just as much Latin I was, as I was allowed to do at university as possible. Imagine Sons 9, Greek Salad. For a week, I travel on business. And on the fourth afternoon, I go to a restaurant to have yet another meal alone. I order a Greek salad and read a Dickens novel to escape my loneliness. When the salad arrives, I barely look. How will Jenny Wren respond to news of her drunken father's death? I push the fork into the lettuce and it yields slowly to the tines. The balance of balsamic vinegar and olive oil with the sweetness of the red lettuce is perfect and I pause, relishing the flavor. I hear the smallest of shrieks. I think I must have anticipated Jenny, that I must have been that engrossed when I hear it again. I put my book down so its open pages press the plastic tablecloth and keep my place, and my fork dives again, spearing a cube of feta. Stop, stop! The sound rises from the salad. Who? What are you? I whisper. Where are you? A black olive wiggles atop a romaine leaf as though to wave. I am your son, brutally transformed. I glance around the restaurant and see the other diners, all in groups engaged in conversation. When I last saw you, you were an infant. How did you get into this state? I think I see him cringe. Meekly, he says, I fell in love with the virgin mistress of the God's own olive grove. And when I made love to her, I was turned into an olive tree. When you made love to her? They say when I raped her. So you are a tree as well as this olive, I ask, trying to move my mouth as little as possible as I see the waiter coming from the kitchen. So she tends to you there in the grove. She only knows I disappeared, the olive whines. She tends to me, yes, but without thought, without love. It is a fate worse than... Delicious, I say to the waiter, swallowing the small olive whole. <laughs> Just delicious. Yes. That's why I gave the preamble, so you'd be less worried about me after you heard the poem. <laughs> so I was composing these imagined sons, these imaginary encounters, and it started to look like something like a book. But I realized there was something missing, or there, it, 
there was something of my experience that these imagined encounters alone weren't capturing. And I heard someone talking about the different types, the different forms a poem could take, and I heard the word catechism. And that was a gift. Um, so there are a number of catechisms in this book, but unlike religious catechisms, these questions repeat the same question over and over again with different answers over time, as I think a lot of us experience. The other thing you need to know um, is about a day that uh, occurred a few weeks after I got to this country. Uh, I woke up one morning feeling sad. Couldn't put my finger on it. And then I realized it was my son's 15th birthday. And then about an hour or two after that, I got an email from my father telling me about the Twin Towers bombing. Mm -hmm. My son's birthday is September 11th, um, and he celebrated, if celebrates the word, his 15th birthday um, on the day of the bombing. And I couldn't help but think, what a horrible thing for a teenager. He's probably supposed to have a pizza party, I don't know, go roller skating, and then the, the one-year memorial, the five-year memorial, the, I mean, what a thing to have your bad birthday conflated with. Um, and so for me, I suppose there's a sense in which personal mourning um, and national mourning become conflated. A Birth Mother's Catechism, September 11th, 1986. What is the anniversary of loss? A national day of mourning. Really now, what is the anniversary of loss? My mother and I watched TV well past her usual bedtime. What is the anniversary of loss? Where the swan's nest had been, widely scattered branches, and some crumpled beer cans. What is the anniversary of loss? Sometimes the melancholy arrives before the remembering. What is the anniversary of loss? Some believe it is impossible to spend too much on the memorial. What is the anniversary of loss? When I say sometimes the melancholy comes first, I know the body has its own memory. What is the anniversary of loss? The wishbone snapped, and I clung to the smaller piece. As long as I lived in the States, I always imagined the place I was most likely to meet my son would be a supermarket. It's where you get the most mix of ages, races, classes, at least so it seemed to me. And so scattered throughout this book are a number of supermarket dreams. And this is the first one. Imagine son six, introducing myself as his, the first supermarket dream. His hand strikes my cheek, and I shudder and sting. His eyes tear and close, his mouth sucks in his lips. The okra and the mangoes are watching, the stock boy and the trio of cheerleaders consider plots. Reflexively, I reach toward him. <laughs> but what reflex is this, so long unused? My mother is at home, he stammers as he recoils. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I whisper to the yams. <sighs> yes, your mother is at home. Imagine son's 18, the businessman. My son gazes from the skyscraper's 23rd floor, his waxy hair set in rigorous waves. When he sighs, he checks to see if anyone hears him, but does not think to look below. Downward, the sigh drifts like first snow. So I stand with my mouth open and my head back to catch it, if I can. I had in imagining him have to also imagine negative possibilities. 
of who he could become. Um, and so in this next one, he's a criminal. There's another series of gross films where I don't know him where he may be gone, he may be dead. This is perhaps a gentler possibility. <coughs> Imagine Sun 17, the courthouse. I sit in the last row. When I read the notice in the paper six weeks ago, I thought about taking up knitting so I could busy my hands and eyes as needed. Instead, I've become nondescript, the murky darkness of dishwater. You arrive in a cheap suit and handcuffs. I am the surprise witness, an unforeseen alibi, another story about who you are and how you got here. <clears throat> Your father will swear me in. So this is how they go, a certain number of um, imagined sons and then another catechism. I would say for relief, but perhaps that's the wrong word. A birth mother's catechism. How did you let him go? With black ink and legalese. How did you let him go? It'd be another year before I could vote. How did you let him go? With altruism, tears, and self-loathing. How did you let him go? A nurse brought pills for drying up breast milk. How did you let him go? Who hangs a birdhouse from a sapling? You're so attentive. I'm so grateful. Your kindness is just... You know, you realize after what comes together the things that you didn't get right. Um, and one thing that I would love to go back with my imagined edits for this book um, is to clarify that, um, and maybe this wouldn't be a good idea, well, we can talk about that, um, is that, uh, that the other woman in this poem um, is the adoptive mother. Um, and my somewhat justification for that was hearing back from the social worker who handled me um, was questions from her about why I didn't just get on with my life. So this is, might be my revenge. Gosh, this is being recorded. <laughs> Imagine Sons 32, the fifth supermarket dream. I lower a jar of salsa into the cart and am startled on rising to face a panting young man. He looks about, and when a 50-some woman in a lavender suit appears at the end of the aisle, he pleads in a whisper, get me out of here. I can't have her catch me again. I'm about to say yes when a manicured hand firmly clasps my shoulder. It is the same woman. Indeed, there are at least a dozen of them, all with tightly bound dark hair, all closing and sure to bear him away. When I start swinging with impeccable aim, <laughs> Imagine Sons 27, the fourth supermarket dream. It's your birthday, I say. What do you want for dinner? He grins. How about ribs? I swing the cart toward the meat coolers, and he keeps pace at my side. The items in the cart rise, barbecue sauce, sour cream, an angel food cake, potatoes, two cobs of corn, chives, salted butter, a box of candles, white frosting, a six pack of Negro Bordello. Who knows if we will ever leave. Imagine 
I'll close with one last Imagine Sons um, and the, one, the last catechism of the book. I want to thank everyone again for coming out and the wonderful people of Poets and Players um, for organizing such an amazing event in this beautiful space. Imagine Sons 28, The Pilot. Two hours into the Bristol Newark flight, the seatbelt symbol lights up with a loud ding. Turbulence. Moments after, a young man, barely of age, emerges from the cockpit in a navy suit and matching cap. Coming down the aisle, humming, he surveys the rows to either side with a proprietary air as he passes. Passengers whisper to one another in point, and a squeal rises when the plane jolts, but his placid expression doesn't acknowledge it. At my row, he halts and asks with a smile, how you doing, ma'am? I look about, noticing quizzical looks. I I'm fine. Are, are you the pilot? I hear the woman next to me swallow hard as I say it. His grin broadens. That would be worrying, wouldn't it? <laughs> Your life in someone else's hands, someone not really grown up yet, you not able to do anything about it. You're not the pilot. You're too young to be the pilot. The plane shudders, and he turns, running back the way he came, becoming younger with each stride until he falls into the arms of a scowling woman, into the shape of an infant, swaddled in navy blue. The last line of this poem uh, comes, refers to the poet Paul Salon, um, and the translation comes from the late and wonderful Michael Hamburger. A Birth Mother's Catechism. When will you let him go? A man carves my name into granite with hammer and chisel. When will you let him go? My grandmother's hair was never white. When will you let him go? This door cannot be lifted off its hinges. When will you let him go? Take two of my ribs to make a fire. When will you let him go? It is time, Salon said. The stone made an effort to flower. Thank you.